Hey, 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 happy Wednesday. Tonight, I am going to actually be sharing a how to play and reviewing Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea from GMT Games. Uh -huh. So you're finally going to find out why this was one of my favorite war games of 2019. And it's not necessarily always a war game either. So come on in, pull up a chair. The Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. So, welcome aboard. I am Jeff McLear, back once again as your host here at The Daily Dope. So, pretty crazy day so far. Uh, we were supposed to get all this snow, and it turned out we got some snow, but not as much snow as people were expecting. And uh, I actually did uh, some standalone videos tonight. So got those done as well. So I was just finishing up my look at Starfinder Deck of Many Worlds, which uh, this video should be up later on tonight on YouTube. But uh, just finished it up about three minutes before I went live. So tonight is Wednesday, February 26th, 2020. And of course, this is episode 448 of The Daily Dope. Uh, let me take a quick peek here. I have not had an opportunity to set up chat for tonight. It's always something. I always forget something. That's It's part of it being live, right? Let me pop this on out real quick. So I've got that available to me. So I apologize for not saying hello to everybody in chat tonight because I forgot to have that up and ready. But part of the reason is because I had just finished up shooting the video for Starfinder's Deck of Many Worlds and I had to set up Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea. So it was like, oh man! It's like zip, 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 zip! Thankfully, it doesn't take that long to set up Civilizations of the Inner Sea. See, Beat Cafe is joining us in chat tonight. Good to see you. Welcome aboard. It is War Game Wednesday. Tonight, I am going to be taking a look at diving on into and reviewing ancient civilizations of the inner sea from my friends over at GMT Games. It is designed by Christopher Voder Bruges and Mark McLaughlin with development by Fred... Uh, Shackner, I believe is the pronunciation on that, or Shackter. Artwork and graphic design is provided by Blackwell Hurd, Kirk Miller, and Chechu Nieto. Game is for one to six players, ages 14 and up. I think that's probably a little high. I would probably go about 12, maybe 13. Plays in two or more hours, and when I say or more, it can be a lot of or more does carry an MSRP of $85. It is available now from GMT Games. As with any GMT game title, as I, whenever I cover them, do unboxings, do reviews, always point out that you want to keep in mind, these are not big print runs. So if you are interested in this game, following this review, by all means, please make sure to uh, jump on board and grab a copy before they sell out because you don't want to get stung with uh, having to pay those high prices on these secondary markets like I have in the past for some GMT stuff. Anyway, let's uh, jump on in. We're going to switch over to the other camera. Flaming Heron's here in chat. So, uh, said they're they're here to interrupt this review. All right, do whatever you want in chat. I don't necessarily have to pay attention to it. <laughs> so, I don't think you're going to, you're going to knock the wheels off of this review. First thing I want to point out has a pretty good size board. It is a wide board, so it is essentially two pieces. 
So just like here and here, I am going to zoom in. We will get a better look at uh, a lot of this as I uh, explain the gameplay and talk about uh, various aspects of ancient civilizations of the inner sea. But I did want to show you just the size itself of the game board. So you're going to need a fairly decent sized table to play on uh, if you are playing with say more than three players because you can play up to six players with this and it and it handles it very very well of course it does increase the play time i will talk about that in just a bit uh about uh how well it plays with four five six players i will point out there are solitaire rules for ancient civilizations of the inner sea i have not played it solitaire i have played it with two players i have played it with four we played most of a six player game. We did not complete it, but we played enough of it where I could figure who was gonna win. So, uh, so Flaming Heron said, oh yes, yes. Cause it's like, there's a curse with me trying to review this game. Every time I've tried to review this, something has happened. I was gonna do a review last week and last minute I was uh, called off to go uh, keep an eye on my niece so there went that but tonight so far so good unless the power sometimes somehow goes out or the internet drops i think we're going to be all right we're going to kind of take a pe uh, peek around this board here so obviously enough this is the mediterranean we are looking at a variety of ancient civilizations that you can take the the helm of one thing that's very, very cool about this is there's kind of a standard six player game that you can play. There are all these historical scenarios you can set up. There are a variety of two player, three player, four player. The rules are very easy to get into. This is probably one of the lowest complexity games uh, from GMT, in my opinion. So very good gateway game to bring people into kind of diplomacy style board games having mentioned diplomacy the old avalon hill classic this is something that if you're a fan of diplomacy i would certainly recommend and i can tell you you will have fewer arguments taking place at your game table with this as well what i am gonna do is i am actually going to make an appearance up here hello all depends on how uh, how I've got things set up for the review if I decide to kind of do a little picture in picture but uh, the way this is gonna be uh, kind of shown off here I can get away with a little picture in picture tonight plus I feel doing a live show and you know I'm not like on screen seems a little rude to me to the viewers now if it's just a recorded like review or unboxing what have you i don't really feel any big deal if i'm not on screen while i'm talking but when i'm doing a live stream yeah i think it's probably a good idea so first off we're going to kind of take a look we've got the various different civilizations we have the home locations for each of the civilizations we have rome we have gaul we have the celts we have Mauritania, we have Carthage, Mycenae, Troy, Minos, Phoenicia, which I thought was very cool that you get the Phoenicians in this. I was, I was dig. I, I'm a fan of ancient history. If you're not familiar with this show, if you haven't watched this before, I do want to point out that um, I, I seem even like like ancient. Uh, civilization games, even like the Civ games on the PC, the Phoenicians kind of get the short end of the stick when they were basically the ancient world's mariners. They were the seafaring peoples, uh, not to be confused with the sea peoples. Ooh, nobody actually kind of knows what exactly or who they were. They also have Egypt down here as well. So one thing, if you uh, know how to count, one thing you'll notice is it's a six player game, but we have more than six civilizations, which I like because you can have various different civilizations in the game. You've got choices here. It's not like there's six civs. That's all you get. That's how it's going to work. And I know I'm going to 
knock these cylinders around constantly. So that is the board here. We have different areas. We have land areas. We have sea areas. We have deep ocean areas where you see this darker blue here. And uh, we've got islands as well. So that is uh, pretty simply how the board is broken up. We don't have a bunch of different terrain types or anything like this. Uh, so Flaming Heron says they were looking forward to this review because they're a big ancient history buff as well, especially for this section of the world. When we, when we take a look at the playbook, and uh, I will spend a little more time looking at uh, the rule book and the playbook than I normally will in a review, because especially the playbook, because I want to show off all the different scenarios that are available in this and how each of the scenarios tweaks the game a little bit. It's not always going to play the same exact way, depending on which historical scenario you're going to play. Also on the board here, we do have a timing area. So we have four epochs that the game takes place in. Each of the epochs could take as many as four turns or as few as two. There is a randomness to that. You're never sure exactly when one epoch is going to end and the next is going to begin until you get to the end of the turn. You also have a civilization turn order, which I'll explain in a moment as well. Then we have a victory track. So we got victory point tracker, I should say. So that's over here also. We've got our rule books. We have player aids for all six players. Thank you very much, GMT. That is so cool. That is so nice. I love to see that. Love to see. Oops, that's actually a solitaire one. Yeah, that's a solitaire player aid. But we've got player aids for each and every one of the players. So that is great. Uh, kind of irritates me sometimes when we, we see a game that's safe for like four players and it's got two player aids and sort of like, really? Come on, you couldn't print up a couple more so everybody gets one? We have various different cards. We have our Fate deck. We're going to dive into that in a few moments. So we got the Fate deck with a variety of different cards in here. I will kind of talk about each of the different kinds of cards. We have wonders that we can build. In fact, I will move the stairway to God over here so that you can see that one. So we have a variety of, of wonders that can be built by each of the civilizations. Each of the civilizations are represented by these different colored discs. Talk about that in a sec. We also have discs in white and black. The black represent barbarians and the white are a variety of different things. Uh, the white can turn out to be uh, loot. It can turn out to also be uh, items in your treasury that you can utilize. And uh, they're kind of an all purpose. So are the actual civilization discs too. Civilization discs represent different things, uh, different times. It is not necessarily say like a game like diplomacy where you have your little, little tokens and they represent armies or navies. These represent most of the time they're going to represent uh, essentially the growth of your civilization. You don't want to look at the discs as being armies in particular. They're more um, like camps and settlements and cities and the spread of your civilization, the spread of your culture, as opposed to just looking at them as, oh, these are armies on the march. So we've got those as well. We also have each of the civilizations will have their own civilization card that you're going to utilize as well. We're going to zoom in. We're going to get a closer look at some of this as well. So the first thing we're going to do, let's zoom in. And we are going to take a look at the rule book. We're not going to go through all the rules. Okay, first of all, I'm, I'm also going to point out, I'm not going to go through like every tiny little aspect of this game because I don't want this to be a two hour video. But something I want to show off, as I mentioned, this is one of the uh, easier games to jump into one of the lower complexity games from gmt right so we're going to just take a peek i did an, a full unboxing video you can look it up 
where we kind of look at all these components and that. So, okay, so these first pages are just kind of talking about, okay, this is about the game. These are the game components. Basic two-player setup. Basic three-player setup. Basic four-player setup. Five-player setup. Six-player setup. Now, we get into page 16, and this is where we're actually going to start getting into the rules of play. Of course, we kind of touch on a little bit. You get to learn it when you're kind of looking at these setups for the players. But we get into the main rules on page 16. Come on. There we go. Done. That's it. These are essentially the rules to the game. Pretty easy peasy. There are a lot of different uh, steps in various phases, but you don't necessarily go through each and every one of them uh, during each and every turn of an epoch as well. So don't be fooled by the game board. Uh, don't let the, the game actually kind of scare potential gamers away because it is an easy game to wrap your head around. It is not necessarily an easy game to win, but it is very easy to jump in and learn to play. So we've got uh, Kevin Thorpe. Good deal. Kevin's in town joining us in chat. So here's the playbook. This is what I was talking about. One of the things I really love about Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea is we are going to have all these different scenarios. So we've got historical scenarios. We've got the Pu the Punic Wars, Second Punic War, Caesar and Pompey, Antony and Cleopatra. We got sandbox situation scenarios. So these are all just these are just kind of standard, still utilizing for the most part the rules as they as they stand in the book. We get the Fall of Rome. This is a multiplayer scenario. We'll get a second Fall of Rome as well. We get Hannibal multiplayer scenario but you'll notice here it's going to start talking about okay so we've got different kind of setup we've got some special rules so we got some different special rules we've got different npc civilizations as well we got different events then we got talks about solitaire play there's the second fall of rome which is set up to be played solitaire as I mentioned, I have not played the game Solitaire. I don't know. I, I would think it would kind of lose some of the appeal that I find with this because of the uh, interaction between the players. I'm not saying that it's, you wouldn't have a good time. I don't know. Like I said, I have not played it Solitaire. But I can tell you one thing that I really, really like about this is the back and forth between the players. And we're going to get to that in just a sec. So here we go. we got another Solitaire scenario. Alexander the Great, another solitaire scenario. So I know some people, you know, look at the MSRP of $85 and they're like, whoa. Now, if you're a war gamer, not so much because we're used to having a little bit higher MSRP because we do realize that our hobby is a niche of a niche, right? But you're getting loads and loads of gameplay and as a solitaire player, what do we got so far? What we saw four, five scenarios already for solitaire. God, King of Egypt. I love how one of the events that takes place in the game is the uh, Sea People's Attack. I find the Sea People's very mysterious, very interesting. And um, you would have thought the Egyptians would have been a a little more precise in exactly who the Sea Peoples were. But I don't think they even really knew either. Uh, there are ways to uh, kind of change the challenge level of the game as well. We do get an example of play for a two-player game here. It's kind of short. It's not as long as some of them that we get. We also get uh, a bit of an article about creating your own scenarios as well. Creating your own civilizations. And we get some clarifications for some of the cards and a quick reference 
as far as uh, an exploration scenario. Another aspect of the game that I really like is you can make this as much of a war game as you want or make it more of a civilization building sort of game. Although I will point out, as opposed to, say, like, civilization or through the ages, things like that, you're not really going to be building technologies, investing in technologies and things like that. Uh, but you can make it where this is more of a Euro game because there is a, there is a Euro flavor to this, or you can make this more of, of a war game of just a little bit abstracted, right? So there you go. So we've got the, there are the rule books and let's take a look at each of our civilizations, the breakdowns of these civilizations here. I'm going to zoom in a little closer. And I think we'll we'll pretty much hang out at this this uh, resolution or what have you. So we've got Rome, and you'll have each of the civilizations are going to have their own special uh, uniqueness to them. They they all play a little bit differently. It would have been they could have been a little bit more definitive and unique, but they each have their own thing. So Robert Carroll. Has stopped by to uh to check out the show. Good to see you, Robert. Thanks for joining us. I think um I think this might be the first time we've seen Robert in chat. So welcome aboard. Glad to have you. So we're gonna have the boards here, and each of the players are gonna utilize their boards. So not only are you gonna have the information about what each civilization's special abilities are, we're gonna have a treasury section here, we're gonna have a ready section here we have a loot section here. So the ready section is where we are going to take discs from our civilization and, and place them to be ready for us to be able to utilize. The treasury is where we're going to actually get white discs for various different things. Same with the loot. The loot, we will use white discs for loot. Loot is uh, essentially when we wipe out a city, is how that works. You'll get loot. You will get one disc of loot. And what, what actually happens with the loot, loot eventually ends up in your treasure. You just don't get to use it the, the exact turn that you you loot the city. You're basically, you're basically raising a city. You're uh, pillaging and uh, destroying a city. So we have Rome those out of the way. We got Rome. There we go. Phoenicia. They are seafaring. Da -da 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 -da. I was playing them. It's, like I said, I, I think they're kind of cool. They play, they're all right. Uh, I think I think Carthage and Rome play a little more interesting than, than Phoenicia. So we've got uh, Hannibal and Hamilcar, of course, or Carthaginians. We've got Troy. Well, 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 we've got Troy. How about that? We've got Egypt. We have the Celt Iberia, which are uh, the Spaniards. We've got Gaul. We've got Mauritania. We've got Minos. And we have Mycenae. So we've got we've got our Greeks. There we go. We got our Greeks. So those are the civilization displays, and you will keep the keep one in front of you while you're playing at all time. So as I mentioned before, the game is broken down into different phases. Uh, you know what? I am going to move this board over a bit more so we can get a little more of this into the shot. There we go. Although this this doesn't really match up, but let's ignore this for a second. We're gonna we're gonna kind of focus on on this here. In fact, let's just do this. There we go. Okay. So let's say for an example, I am gonna play the Greeks. Right. So here we go. You're gonna start off in just the standard in the standard game. Everybody's gonna get a dozen discs to start off with. 
gonna place two in your home location. And then you have the option of being able to place two in every adjacent area to it. So you do that. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. That C. Aegean. Okay. So that's how each of the players are going to start off. This is kind of like the shallow C here. So you do have stacking limitations normally, and you can increase the stacking limitations on land just before we get into the competition phase, which is kind of the battle phase. So Robert Carroll says very solid game can be swingy and some grown yalls or civ buffs will not find it historically satisfying. But if you approach it as game and not sim civ builder plays just fine. Yep. I'm right with you on that. Right with you on that. Uh, you can you can play this more. It's kind of like a Euro game where you don't have a whole lot of conflict. Uh, once we get in where I'm showing the cards, that's when you're going to see where you've got a lot of take that going on. And yes, it can. The different cards that come into play, if they're utilized against you, can really, really throw a wrench into your plans. So you're going to start off these are your settlements. So effectively, if you have one disc, that's considered a camp. Two discs is a settlement. Three discs is a city. So you're going to start off, each of the players are going to have a variety of different settlements. For them to be able to spread across the board, we are going to have a growth phase. So in the growth phase, players are going to receive a uh a disc for every city that they have and they'll also receive a disc for every two c locations that they control so for an example these are being controlled because there's nobody else here there's no one else here so that means we've got control of that so when we get into the growth phase we're going to start looking to because because you have some options here. You can try to spread out, right? You can kind of try to spread out across the board and just spread your influence, but you can end up spreading yourself thin. And of course, depending how many players you have and where those players are set up, you may not have the luxury of being able to spread out because it's possible you can be stuck between, say like uh, Rome and the Celts and you're kind of kind of stuck uh so <clears throat> for an example you could have the greeks and troy well you're not going to be able to spread out too much here what you can do though is you can always place discs into an area that has another civilization's discs in it now you can only place discs adjacent to areas that you already have some sort of a representation in right by having settlements or camps or cities but here's an interesting aspect which i had to always keep remembering because i am so used to playing twilight struggle and other games which when you say like you're putting influence in well you can't piggyback and chain onto it and put another point like further on you can't chain together right so if i put influence in or if i drop something here in most games i can't if i have more of these to go i can't just go okay boom now i put it there in this game you can in this game you certainly can so that will allow you to kind of spread out uh much easier so each of the players will also begin the game with some some discs in their supply. So you're gonna go through your your phase where we have the growth phase. So you, uh, you'll you acquire your discs and then we have you can have resettlement. You can actually take discs away from areas because this is your limitation. This is what you've got. 
you have 50 discs total. I believe it's 50 uh, total for you to utilize. So there is no borrowing from other civilizations that aren't in play or anything like that. No, you are limited to what you have in your supply. So this, is, this would be considered your supply. So you can, if you, if you like, for an example, if you find you've actually kind of spread yourself too thin and you're running out, you can actually remove discs from areas as well. It's, uh, it's, it's, you can also resettle. So you can actually take a disc from a city and resettle it in another location as well. So, uh, so that's what's going on as far as growth is you're going to receive new discs depending on how many cities you've got and how many sea areas you control then you can have your uh re returning that's what they call retirement you can retire discs from areas and you also have the uh resettlement where you can take a disc from a city and place it somewhere else as well then we have deployment and that's when you're going to start putting out like so like that right or i could say okay well i want to have a city here so with like civilization games there's there's kind of a kind of a phrase going long you can either go wide or you can go tall so the way this kind of game plays out is you got to balance how wide, which is how far you're going to spread out and how tall, how many cities or settlements you're going to build all the time, knowing that you've got a limitation. Then we go into the card phase. This is where the meat and potatoes of this game is, is the card phase. So we got this big fate deck. Got all these fate cards. And you're actually going to take a few of these cards out. You're going to take 10 of the cards out of the deck. So you're not going to always have every card in the game. But still, this is a pretty big deck. And it's made up of a variety of cards. So we have different types of cards. So we have just kind of standard cards that do different things. So here we've got, and I, I like the layout of these cards too they're pretty cool i like the artwork that's on these as well and the card stack's really nice of course as i always say if it's a game you're going to play quite a bit you're going to want to sleeve your cards regardless of how nice the card stack is so this is kind of a standard card it says refugees select a land area adjacent to any map edge remove one disc from that area if any then place two barbarian discs there so remember I was talking about we've got these black discs or barbarians. They can be trouble. So they, they can pop up anywhere at any time, all because of these cards. Now each of the players is going to start with a hand of five cards. And you have a hand limit of six. If at any point in time you ever have more than six cards, you have to discard down to six. It's not wait till the end of the turn or anything like that. Always have to have no more than six cards. So something like this is going to happen again. So it says shuffle back into the draw pile. And I'll talk about shuffling a little bit later. Millennial Volcanoes. Remove a total of four discs from at least three contiguous areas. It says set aside when played. Shuffle back into the draw pile at the end of the epoch. So as you can see, we already have these different cards that are saying, okay, well, you're going to remove. You're going to remove discs uh you're also gonna see uh you'll see like opposing civilizations competition things like that that just means every other civilization than your own so spy a great person take one card at random from a, an opposing civilizations and crop failure remove one disc from each of the three uh contiguous land areas see you to britain hey something good Gain two talents, which would go... Talents go into your treasury here. It says, gain two talents, then every civilization that occupies at least one area bordering the Atlantic 
which is way up in the corner of the board. Or bordering the western edge of the map gains one talent. So these are kind of like just regular cards. So you're just going to play them. And in the in the card phase, every civilization in turn order is going to play a card. So I, let's say I, I'm the first player. I get to play a card. Let's say Cameron's the second player. He plays a card. Then Lexi's the third player. She plays a card. Maybe we're just playing three-player game. It comes back to me. And I play Refugee. At the, at the end of the turn, you're going to have a draw phase. So the most cards you can ever draw is going to be five. So if you are used to kind of card-driven games where you're going to kind of play all of your cards in a turn, that sort of does happen in this game quite a bit. You don't have to. Sometimes there's cards you, you might want to hang on to for later on to bust out a, a big whammy on someone. So I see uh, Jorge Rodriguez is joining us in chat. Good to see you, Jorge. Thanks for popping in. So these are kind of the standard sorts of cards. And on the bottom, you always look to see what the bottom says because it, it might say, remove the card from play, which means you just remove it from the game. Some will say like this one says, put it to the side. It's gonna go shuffle back in at the end of the epoch. Some just say, shuffle it back into the draw pile. Then we got events. So there are seven events and they will have an E. They will have a big red banner up top. And these are played immediately. And when I say they're played immediately, I mean they are played when you draw this card. Or sometimes you'll, you'll have uh, instructions to draw a card from the draw deck. If this comes up, then you play it immediately. And then for an example, if you got it in your draw phase, you're going to play it and you're going to replace it with a new card. Which could possibly turn into another event. Who knows? But events play immediately. You do not hold these in your hand. So for an example, here we have Southern Raiders. The player of the fewest VP selects a land area on the southern edge of the map. Place four Barbarian Discs there and four into every adjacent land area. Fewest cities have tied for the fewest victory points. There you go. Boom. Southern Raiders. And then it gets discarded. Now you'll notice this does not say remove it from the game. Then we have other cards, which will show an eye. These are investment cards. These are cards that you'll actually play and then you will leave them near your civilization display and you will do different things with them. So for an example here, the Academy of Science shows card draw. Some of these cards will actually have uh, kind of like tags on them almost to tell you kind of, what does this do? What does this help you with? So for an example, this says, place this card face up on the table with three discs from your supply. So let's pretend these are three. We put it there. You can spend these discs. So it's gonna tell you at the beginning of your draw step, you may return a disc to supply. If you do draw three cards, keep one and discard the other two. And when you run out of the three discs, you spent all the discs, this would get discarded. So that's an investment card. Here's give me an example. Here's another one. Kevin, Kevin, <laughs> Caravanissary. I think that's how you pronounce it. Can Caravanissary. Once again, this is kind of card draw. It tells you here. It says, place this card face up on the table with three discs from the supply atop it. Getting your draw phase. It did the same thing. Draw two cards. Discard one of the cards. Now the Academy of Science let you draw three. This one, let's draw two. Then we have, let's go to the negation cards. We have, we have cards that negate things. So, and they'll have an N. So when somebody plays a card, uh, and in a funny way, the, the best way I would explain this to, to, to the gang, which they thought was kind of funny, but this is how I explained it and made sense to them. is because they all play Magic the Gathering, either the actual cards or online. And I said, you know when you play an interrupt card? And they're like, yeah. I said, that's what a negation card is, or a negate card is. It's like an interrupt. So if somebody plays a card, and if you have a negate card that can stop it, and if you want to stop it, 
you're going to play the negate card. So as an example here, right, we had a... Uh, didn't we have a spy? Yep, here we go. We had a spy. So as an example, let's say somebody played the spy card, and I've got assassin. Great person. It says, play in response to a great person card, negate that card, and discard it. So I could stop someone from playing this spy card by negating them. Now, it's possible somebody could negate this negation. If Because there are some... Negate cards, it just says negates any card. Some negate only specific kinds of card play. So for an example, here we got uh, Bad Omens. Play in response to an opposing civilization, activating the benefit of a wonder. I'll show you the wonders in just a moment. And negate the benefit. Remove discs are still spent. So there's kind of the, oh, I was planning on doing this. And then suddenly you go, somebody says, oh, 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 oh no, you don't. And then someone says, ha oh, oh, ha, guess again. And they, it's really actually pretty entertaining. Really do get a, get a kick out of it. Uh, Kabuki Kid says, interrupt. I'm old school magic, yes. Uh, my nephew's been playing it for a long, long time. And he, he knew what I meant when I said interrupt, because that's what I always say. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Just shows you, I, I started playing magic when the beta cards came out. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I'm that old. All right, so. So those are the negation cards. Then we also have, after the card phase, we have a competition phase. The competition phase is kind of like the battle phase. So what will happen here, as I mentioned before, you can always place. Let me grab. Let's grab some purple. So as an example, let's say we got Minos here. Minos is one of the civs we're playing here, right? Grab a few more. Come on, why is it just sticking to my finger? Try to stack them up. So here we have three, we have two. So that's a city, that's settlement. Remember, one is just a camp. When you're in, at sea, uh, at sea is basically, this is just kind of considered like a like a fishing fleet or you, you have a presence in the sea in that area. Two means that you're actually making a concentrated effort to command that area of the sea. Uh, the second limitation at sea is two. On land, it is three, but in the we can overstack. So we can overstack uh, leading up to the competition phase. So as an example, let's say we've got, uh, let's say we've got a laid out like this. and We only have the one here. So as we were going around and everybody does their, their deployment, let's say Minos deployed two discs here. And I only have one. So this means this is a contested area. So that means we are going to have some sort of a fight here. And when we get into the competition phase, we normally will start and resolve all comp. It's, it's like conflict, right? But it's just competition. See, once again, like I said, there's a little bit of a Euro style to this game. So it's kind of like, well, we don't want to call it battle, right? Oh, oh gosh. Oh. Uh, interestingly enough, this game is from the same design team that did uh, Hitler's Reich, which I reviewed last year. I thought it was okay. Uh, uh, I like this a whole lot better. So anyway, we're going to resolve conflicts from the upper uh, right-hand corner of the board, which is kind of like the northeastern corner just resolve them as we go around now we have cards which are utilized in the competition phase of the game so for an example i have composite bow it says play in if the competition is in a land area remove from the competition area two discs belonging to each opposing faction so because you can have more than one. You could have a bunch of civilizations all like piled into one area. 
So I could play this because because the actual resolution of competition is really simple. It's basically everybody starts removing one at a time until only one remains. So with two to one, that would basically be the resolution of this competition. I would lose control of this area to my nose. If you ever get to the point where just one and one, you stop because you will still have a contested area as far as this goes. Uh, Kabuki Kid says, I still play with interrupt cards. They're just now eroded to be instants. That's kind of funny. So, as I mentioned, so we've got, I could like say for an example, this is my competition here. I could play this. These cards will take place before competition of that area. They're played face down. So each of the opposing factions, opposing civilizations are gonna, if they're playing any, you're gonna play them face down, it really reveals them at the same time. So as an example here, if my opponent didn't play one, I would remove their two, they would go back to the supply. Whenever you remove discs, they always go back to the supply. And that'd be it. That'd be the end of the competition and I would still retain control of that area. So uh, Robert had mentioned before that the game can be very swingy and that is very true because a lot of times you can plan stuff out and a single card play is going to let the air out of your balloon. It's just part of the game. Uh, one of the players, one of the gang, got a, was getting a little, I don't wanna say, Pissed, but they were a little ticked that it seemed every time they tried to do something it got unraveled by somebody playing cards and i'm like yeah well but take a look at what you're doing to people too oh it's like come on kabuki kid says uh they haven't used the term instant since 1999 jeez well what can i tell you I'm sorry, they haven't used interrupt, not instant, interrupt. All right, so those are the types of cards. So as I mentioned, everybody's going to get five cards. You're going to go through your turn. If you, if you want to hang on to cards, you don't want to play them, you pass. Once everyone is passed or everybody's out of cards, which means you're going to have to pass, now you're going to look to move to the next turn and possibly the next epoch. So you're always going to have a first turn. You're always going to have a second turn. So what you're going to end up doing, let's say we, we've used some of these cards. So let's say we're in the first epoch and we've just finished the second turn. We are going to draw a card. We're going to take a look. And if there's the number one anywhere on this card, that first epoch has ended. We are going to move into the second epoch. There are four epochs. To the game so for an example here right here 31 we have a 31 so that is a one so we know that is going to end the epoch one of the cool things that i thought was pretty wild is that we have a change of epoch table so we're going to look at the card id the card id here is 31. so it's going to say the wrath of god measured and found wanting the civilization with the most VPs loses one VP for every two cities it has rounded down. So we will have like just different random stuff that will happen at the end of the epoch. So if we weren't ending the epoch, and one thing I should say, if we were going from the third to the fourth turn and I flipped it over, it would be a one or a two. That's anywhere on the card. So for an example here, it says place two barbarian discs. That would count as a two. It doesn't have to be the number down here. It can be on actual text of the card. So, uh, so if we were not ending the epoch, what we would do is each of the players would be able to draw three cards plus uh, one card if they have four or more cities, and they get one more card if. Um, Oh, that's right, if they spend talent. So let's talk a little bit about these talents. 
and we'll talk a little bit about removing discs. So you can you can you'll have these loots or well they're talents. But loot becomes talents. Remember I was talking you'll have these white discs. You might earn these white discs. So you can pay it one talent to prevent the loss of a disc. Right? So my my buddy here could have paid to prevent losing those two. So you can use a talent to pay for it. You can also uh, discard a card. You can pay a talent to buy a card during the draw step. You can pay three talents to buy a victory point during the end of epoch phase, which if we were ending the epoch, you would be able to spend three talents in order to get uh, a victory point because whatever talents you've got at the end of the epoch, if you don't spend them, they are lost. Okay, so with it not being the end of the epoch, what you're going to do is you're going to draw your cards and we're going to move to the next turn. We are going to determine turn order, which, of course, we got the little track down down there. And we do that by whoever's got the most cities. And that's how we're going to go one, two, three, four. If you're playing six players, you go one, two, three, four, five, six. If there's a tie, you're looking at whoever's got the fewest victory points uh, is actually going to go ahead or they can decide if they want to go ahead or not. So for an example, if I had the most victory points, I would go first. Minus could go second. Uh, if we were tied with cities, but they had fewer victory points, they could say, well, you know what? I'm going to go first. Or they could say, you know what? I'd rather just go second. That's fine. I'll go second. See what you're doing. Let you set the uh, pace. So we've got that. We also have wonders. Let's look at the wonders. You have an opportunity to build wonders. And these are pretty cool. Although I was kind of surprised that we don't get... So for an example here, it's the Grand Garden. Why don't they just call it the Hanging Gardens? I believe that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the Hanging Gardens. So, you know, like, we got the Great Library. Isn't this supposed to be the Great Library at Alexandria? I understand why you wouldn't say Alexandria, because it could be with any civilization. So you can build these wonders, and it's going to cost you a combination of discs or cards or... Um, uh, gosh, what's the... Uh, talent. So... That's how you're going to build your gardens, and if you or build your wonder, there are the six wonders. There are not seven in the game. There are six wonders, and if you build the wonder, you have to place it in a location that has a city. So, for an example, we'll say put it there. Then you're going to have your card. It's going to tell you what that does. So it says one built, this is Grand Gardens, one built, place five discs from supply atop this card. During the acquisition step of your growth phase, you may remove a disc from this card. If you do, place it along with up to one additional disc from supply into an area or areas you occupy. So that's what that would do. Once you've placed all five discs, you still have the wonder, but it's not really going to do anything for you. So we've got that. We've got the ability to build these wonders uh, they're interesting. They they offer little wrinkles. What I kind of found was a little odd about them was that essentially you could build them like in the first turn. It's I mean it's it's not impossible. Hey, Robert Schneggenberger has arrived. I'm sure I always mess that up. So uh Babylonians copyrighted that. I'm looking to see. Oh, it rains when it rains, it pours. So Glowing Turtle is here. Hey, sorry about that. When I'm doing reviews and stuff like that, I usually, you know, kind of miss when people are popping in. Glowing Turtle, I am reviewing Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea. I'm almost finished, actually. All right. So anyway, uh, as I mentioned, so what you would do if you were not ending the epoch is you would go and just simply start up again you have a draw phase remember having a hand limit of six cards and then you're going to determine the, the turn order and then you're going to go through your growth phase 
your card phase, competition phase. There is a reckoning phase where there's just little, little bitty things that you're kind of going through. So, for an example, right? So, let's say your civilization is getting shellacked. And, you know, you're only in, like, the first turn of the second epic. Right? You can effectively kind of throw in the towel with that civilization and play a new civilization. So that that is an option. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of that, simply because it does make the game... Well, I, I don't know. I would think the game kind of drags on a little more than it should if you do that, but I don't know. I, I understand why it's there. I understand it's, you know... Player elimination, people do not like player elimination, especially in Euro-type games. Yes, so, uh, of course, Pinky's down here sneezing, so if you heard that, that's what that weird noise was. She sneezes in rapid succession. So, yes. Good old Pinky came down to visit. All right, so uh, you're going to continue playing till you reach the final turn of the final epoch. And once again, remember, you never know how many turns each of the epochs is going to have. So as like for an example, when you go from the second to the third turn, yeah, it's a little more likely you may not have, you know, a, a, a fourth turn if you get to a third turn. Yes, Kabuki Kid says machine gun sneezes. Yep, that is how Pinky operates. So once you get to the fourth epoch, all you basically do, let me move the board here. Get some of this stuff out of the way so don't knock it onto the floor. You are going to whoa, take a peek to see who's leading on the victory point track. So as you can see, the victory point track doesn't go very high because you're essentially getting the victory points for the um, your cities, the number of cities. You get a victory point for each city. You can buy victory points with those talents at the end of an epoch as well. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much where you're getting your, your victory points from. And essentially, whoever's got the most victory points wins. Of course, if uh, if you do have a tie, there are tiebreakers as well. So, Flaming Heron asked, uh, sorry, I missed it. Do you have any wonders for the sieves? You do. I'll real quickly I'll show you the cards. They're all these blocks. It's cool. Cool little wooden blocks. We have the six wonders of the ancient world, not seven. I don't know. Got six. So we've got the Grand Gardens, which is basically the Hanging Gardens. The Pyramids. Great Library at Alexandria. The Grand Temple. I'm not positive what that's supposed to be. Uh, I'm not sure if that's supposed to be like the, the Temple at Delphi. I'm not sure. Oh, and it looks like we're getting... Um, looks like we, we were dropping some frames there. Hopefully that uh, smooths out. Which is weird, because we know once the video renders, it'll be fine. Uh, we've got the mausoleum and the great lighthouse. So, which I... Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not sure... Well, I guess I understand why they didn't put, like, why it's not the hanging gardens and stuff like that. So those are the, the wonders that you can have. Uh, they are pretty cool. They're not that difficult for the civilizations to build, which I was kind of surprised. So that is, in essence, how you play ancient civilizations of the inner sea from my pals over at GMT Games. So let's switch on over to the other camera, and I will share with you my... If I can get this over... My final thoughts and my review score. All right, so I had pointed out during the video that I shot, oh, it was what, early January? Late, late December, early January, I talked about my favorite games of 2019. And yes, 
ancient civilizations of the inner sea is one of them and i'll tell you why now it's not perfect and as uh one of the roberts i forgot your last name robert sorry uh had pointed out robert number one the first robert to show up in chat tonight had pointed out that this is a fun game if you look at it as a game if you look at it is this is a historical simulation of the ancient world or as it being like a civ building game like Sid Meier's Civilization games, you're going to be sorely disappointed. That said, there's a lot going on that I really do like about this game. I love the fact that there's all these different scenarios. You can play it all different ways. There's Solitaire, which, like I said, I have not played. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. There are seven wonders. There's a stairway to God. I'm, I'm sitting there going, I could have sworn there was another wonder here. But I only see the six. It got it got bumped off to the side when I was moving boards around. I was going to say, I could have sworn there was one more wonder, but I guess I'm wrong. No, I guess I was right. Anyway, um... If, uh, if you have any sort of interest in checking out Diplomacy, if you've heard about Diplomacy over the years, but you've been kind of scared away from it because you've heard these stories about, oh, the big fights and arguments. I've never seen that happen in a game of Diplomacy that I played, but I'm sure it does happen. If you're concerned about that, then by all means, definitely give a look to ancient civilizations of the inner sea because it's got sort of that same feel to it it is crunchier actually than diplomacy diplomacy is very abstract uh just some of the rules are not as ironed out as they should have been that's what leads to the arguments so uh i love the fact that it's very easy to teach i'm a big fan of take that in games so i enjoy messing with other people playing cards, laughing maniacally <laughs> when I do something that, you know, completely blows up what their their plan is, their strategy is. So I love doing that. Some people, if you don't like take that, you're not definitely, you're definitely not going to like that. So, um, yes. So there's no stairway wonder. I guess they replaced the statue. It's a stairway to heaven. It's Led Zeppelin. It's a picture of Led Zeppelin on the on the block here. So, uh, anyway, so there's a bunch of stuff going on that I really, really like. I, I actually like the fact that, you know, you've got your supply of discs and it's a limited supply of discs and you can only, you can only spread out so far and you have to look at, well, remember you get victory points for the cities. You got to have cities and if you got a bunch of cities that also means that you're not going to be sprawled out all across the entire map of the ancient world here so i like that as well uh i like the component quality is excellent all around love the fact you got six player aids so each player gets a player aid that's important to me also love the fact that we've got more than six different civilizations that you can play and we've got all those different scenarios that you can jump into as well uh, i have played it with two players had a lot of fun played it with four players had a blast played it with six players and although i was enjoying myself and cameron was having fun and the hunter was having a good time and some of his you know there were a couple friends who were clueless as far as what this game was going to be about it took a long time. So remember when I started this off, I said, oh, this game is for one six players, ages 14 and up, although I think it's about 12. Plays in two or more hours. If you're going to do six players, it's going to be a lot more than just or more. You're probably looking at five hours, maybe six, which to be honest, that never bothered me. Uh, I am, I come from the old school where we could get together on a Saturday afternoon when I was in high school and sit down and play one game from noon until two o'clock in the morning. 
most people are not like that anymore. So I do want to point out that is one thing. Keep in mind if you are like, oh yeah, man, I a six player game. This sounds fantastic. Love it. You play it to completion. It's going to take a while. Just pointing that out. You're going to have a good time, especially if you're like sticking it to people because I like it. Uh, then, but it is going to take a bit of time. Something else I want to point out. We do have the cards that say shuffle back into the uh, draw deck. There are a decent number of cards that say shuffle back into the draw deck. And unfortunately, it gets to the point where you're doing a lot of shuffling. So, the way I got around it, I'm just how I did it, is that whenever we ran across a card that said shuffle back into the draw deck, we put the card to the side. When we finished that turn, I then shuffled those cards back into the draw deck. I did not shuffle the card back in the draw deck every time somebody played a card that said shuffle it back into the draw deck because then you're you're spending way too much time shuffling cards and if you don't have the cards sleeved you're putting a lot of wear and tear on these cards even though i said they've got nice nice uh nice coating on them nice stock as well you're still gonna beat the hell out of these cards constantly shuffling the deck so that was just a little, yeah, little, little ding I have to give it. And uh, I do want to point out that, yes, it can take quite a long time to play the more players you have. Two-player game, you can rock through pretty quickly. About 90 minutes is what it was taking Cameron and I playing two, two players. So all in all, I really do like this game. There's a lot going for it. As I mentioned, it is a game. It is not a simulation. Do not look at it as a simulation. If you look at it as a sim you are going to be disappointed if you look at it as, hey, it's a cool game that's got a you know ancient history kind of flavor to it, and each of the civilizations have a unique feel to them, then I will wholeheartedly recommend this. So on a scale of 1 to 10, I definitely give Ancient Civilizations of the Inner Sea a 9.4 out of 10. Ding it a little bit because of all the shuffling kind of thing. Uh, and dung it a little bit uh, simply because of how it can, uh, with more players, it can slow down. It, can, it, it doesn't get bogged down, but it does take quite a bit longer. So that is pretty much it for tonight's show. Let's take a quick look here at chat. So Kabuki Kid says, I was in a diplomacy game ages ago where someone did flip out and stormed out of the house, cursing us all out. Oh yeah, it happened. I'm not, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Here's the reason why uh, this is different than diplomacy. As far as you're not going to see as much. Oh, getting all upset. Yes, you can. You can have diplomacy in the game. You can tell other players, hey, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. You cannot share cards. You can't. You can't share discs. You can't show people the cards that you've got. Unless you're playing in teams, that is an option. You can play teams. But if you're just playing everybody's kind of for themselves, you can say you're going to do something and then not do it. But in Axis and uh, not Axis and Allies, in Diplomacy, the problem is that you had to plot out everything you're going to do ahead of time. So you had that like Diplomacy phase, which was like 10 minutes, where you could get together with other people and go, okay, well, if you do this, if you support me on this, I'll support you on that. Blah, blah, blah. I'll do that. Blah, blah. And then if you decide, well, I'm not going to do it, then it, everything falls apart for, you know, whatever plans the person that you made a promise to has already written down. Uh, all falls apart. None, it can't happen, right? So it's like, okay, so that's why you would get people get really pissed off. But the whole point of it is it's diplomacy. You can say you're going to do something and then not do it because it's not really in your best interest. So that could happen. Uh, here, not so much. Here, not so much because you're not writing stuff down ahead of time and having to hand it in so that everybody's moves are all in at one time. Everybody is taking turns. 
So if somebody's screwing you over you, and it's not your turn yet, you already know you've been screwed over. So now you have to adapt. So that's how I kind of saw it. So, uh, bu -bu all day, all day access and allies, Dune or diplomacy games. Well, I don't remember playing all day Axis and Allies. I know we played Third Reich quite a few times. It was a long, long game. Boy, and that is not a game that aged well either way, uh, either. So, yes, I actually have a soft spot for Axis and Allies myself. Uh, real quick, funny story. And once again, it looks like our frames are jumping all over the place. Uh, when I lived in New Mexico, I lived in Albuquerque for about three years, three or four years. And I had a roommate and I had some buddies I worked with and some of us used to get together and we would play Axis and Allies and just drink beer while we played Axis and Allies. And I had a friend who uh, dipped chewing tobacco. So they would actually pack their upper lip with chewy tobacco while they were drinking their beers, playing Axis and Allies. It was kind of bizarre looking. So, yep. So I enjoy my adult beverage from time to time, what can I tell you? All right, that is it for tonight's show. If you like the video, please give it a quick thumbs up. And of course, subscribe to the channel. If you do, don't forget, ring that little bell. It will not only notify you when the Daily Dope goes live, it will also tell you when I upload standalone videos, such as my video for Starfinder Deck of Many Worlds that will be up later on tonight. So, don't forget that. Do you want to mention, before I go, tomorrow's show, we're going to take a look at Pathfinder, Lost Omens, Gods, and Magic from Paizo Inc. It's Thursday. I like doing RPG stuff on Thursdays. No show Friday, because I will be covering C2E2, downtown Chicago. All right. Anyway, as I said, that's it for tonight's show. Everybody who hung out in chat, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Always like people hanging out with me company while I'm doing the live show. Of course, when you are not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to go visit GamingGang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill. Get your geek on at GamingGang.com. Anybody who is watching, whether live or on Memorex, Thank you so very much. I will be back tomorrow. So until then, everybody enjoy your Wednesday night and happy trails. Oh, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. And of course, if you want to catch up on past episodes of The Daily Dope, check out this playlist. And if you'd like to see what YouTube's recommending you take a peek at from the channel, just give a click right over here. Of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. And once again, thank you very much for watching.